News 46, local coverage you can count on. Welcome to One Man's Faith. My name is Neil Owen. Glad to have you with me tonight. And we are just here to have a little bit of fun with God. And, and well, not, you know, being in the presence of God and learning about His Word is fun. And that's what, that's what we want to have. We just want to have fun. We want to see what God is saying and, and learn from it, not be overwhelmed by it, but come to an understanding that God has given us His Word for us to learn how to be like Him, how to move toward Jesus and be like Jesus. And as a matter of fact, I think 1 John 1, 5 says that so we are to be as Jesus is in the world. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. And <clears throat> that's an awesome thing to think about. And so that's something for us to move toward. We are to be conformed to the image of His Son. And that means we walk the way Jesus walked, in purity, in power, and in wisdom. And we learn wisdom by looking at His Word. And so with that, we're going to look at uh, Proverbs again. We're going to look at number 10 of the, My Son, if you'll do this, then this. Number 10 out of 14 that are listed between Proverbs 1 and Proverbs 9. And number 10 is found in Proverbs 6. Um, and while you are turning there, let me just say we have um, several things. Well, let's just, let's just look real quick at, at a synopsis of what we've been looking at because it's, it's been kind of, a, it's, it's been a while uh, since we started this, he started it, um, uh, he said, My son, listen to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teachings. That was the very first one over, I think, in chapter 1, because it will be a graceful wreath to your head and an ornament to your neck. It will uh, signify victory. It will, it will be a victory in your life. Number two was receive my sayings, treasure my commands, Give your ear, may your ear be attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding, cry out for discernment, lift your voice for understanding, seek her wisdom, search for her, then, uh, then discern, and with that you will then discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. That was number two. Number three, do not forsake teaching. Keep you and let your heart keep the commandments. And with that, you have length of days and years of life and peace will be added unto you. Number four, uh, not uh, reject discipline of the Lord, nor loathe his reproof. And with that, for whom he loves, he reproves as a father, the son in which he delights. See, if God didn't love you, he wouldn't set up things to make you see what you're doing that needs to bring that you need to bring correction to. Just as if your father doesn't love you, he'll let you do whatever you want to. Now, some of us have lived through that, haven't we? But if a, if a parent loves you, he won't let you put your hand on that stove to burn you. You know, there are things that that we we've, we've got to understand that our parents did for us because they loved us. In the same way, God loves us, and so. He brings reproof. He teaches us. He corrects us in a loving way. And, and that was number four. Number five, let them not depart from your sight. 
In other words, the instructions. Keep sound wisdom and discernment and they will be a life to you and to your soul and adorn your neck. Number six, hear the instruction of the Father and give attention uh, to gain because that is sound teaching. Um, and number seven, um, my son, accept my sayings and it will bring years of life. Again, you see, if we'll listen to what's being taught us, we'll gain life. That's, an, you know, that, that's not a flippant statement. That's a, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, a bold proclamation. If you will listen to the words that I, that I have given you, this is what, this is what God is saying through Solomon, then you will have life. Number eight, give attention to my words and incline your ear to my sayings because those words are life and death. There it is again. Number nine, that, um, Oh, number nine is give attention to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding because it will bring, it will observe discretion and uh, your lips will be reserved for knowledge. Number 10 that we looked at last time was listen to me, do not depart from them, don't go near the adulterous woman. Is It was kind of the basis of that. And so today we're we're going to look at Proverbs 6, uh, verse 20. My son, observe the commandments of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually in your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you wake, they will walk with you. For the commandment is the lamp. And the teaching is light. And reproofs for discipline are the way of life. To keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her catch you with your eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he's hungry. But when he is found, he must repay. Sevenfold, he must give all the substance of his house. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would destroy himself does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not, will not be blotted out. For jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of, of vengeance. He will not accept any ransom, nor will he be content, though you give him gifts. So he's saying in verse 20, my son, observe the commandments of your father, which would be the commandments that God gave. And do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them on your heart. And when you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you wake, they will talk to you. Because the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light. So God has given us his word. And it, now this is all in the context of being worthless. And, and uh, it, it, it's, there's some just in, a gob of interesting, interesting scriptures here, especially in chapter 6. Um, he even talks about the ant and the sluggard and, and, you know, not being observant and, and not listening is like being a sluggard. You know, we need to listen, we need to hear, we need to understand, and we need to follow what God has given us. And that's what he wants. Because he, the commands are a lamp and the teachings are a light. They, they light up the area and they light your path. We looked a couple of weeks ago, you are to be a light in the world. 
How do you be a light? Well, here's one of the ways. Be obedient to the commands. And that's what God, would, that's what God wants from you. So, Father, we just praise you for this evening. Lord, go out. Open our hearts, Lord. May we hear what you're saying, that we will become a lamp to this community, that we will salt it and bring flavor and seasoning and preserve it from death. May your kingdom come, Lord. May your will be done here in Pahrump as it is in heaven. And we claim Pahrump for the name of Jesus. And we praise you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Okay, before we go into our, uh, our real teaching, um, I want to just uh, let you know a couple of things. I'm, I'm, um, I, had a, I, had, um, I had somebody ask me a question, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and answer that question in the, in the next section, or at least I'll, I'll give my observation of that question. Um, but maybe you've got questions about the Word. Now, I'm not an expert because an X is a has-been and a spurt is a drip under pressure. So I'm not an expert. But I will be, you know, I will be honest as I can and, and try and give you uh, a perspective on the question that you have. Uh, that may sound a little nebulous, but... You know, because I'm not an expert, I'm not, and I'm never, I've never tried to be. I don't want to be, but I love God's word, and and I've been places with God's word, and so I can, I could, I may even be able to give you another side of the real question behind your question. So you know, if you'd like to send me a question. Uh, you can uh, go out to our website, www.nhfministries.org. And if you go to uh, the link for New Hope Fellowship, and then you'll see a, you'll see a link that says contact us. You can, um, it'll take you to a page. And you can fill it out with the question you have. You can, you know, you can be anonymous if you want to. You don't have to be, you know, I, you know, I like to know who. It's just, it's just nice to know. Uh, and I'll present the question and, and, bring something, and bring something to it. So if you'd like that, or give us a call at New Hope Fellowship, 751-1867, and just say, I've got a question for Pastor Owen, uh, and will he try and answer it, okay? And that'll be great. So with that, uh, let's just take a little break and we'll be back in just a minute. Romans 10, 9, it says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, it says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Welcome back for the second part of One Man's Faith. Again, my name is Neil Owen. Glad you're with me tonight. And right now, I want to um, I want to look at a question. This question was presented to me. I haven't had a chance to get back to this person, but I will uh, this week. But I thought I'd I thought I'd use it just kind of as a springboard into what I just said a minute ago about if you have a question, um, get hold of me one way or another. Call the office or go to the website and go to our contact page and, you know, and just type the question out. But the question that was asked me is this. Is there a biblical reference for being slain in the Spirit? Okay, that's a term that is, that is being um, used more now than ever before. Being slain in the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Um, Generally, that term used today means this. You go up for prayer. Maybe you're at a conference. Maybe someone's praying over you. Maybe they're laying hands on you to um, do what they call an impartation. Or maybe they're giving you a prophecy or whatever. And sometimes you can be touched. Sometimes you're not. But you fall over. Okay? You lay down on the floor. Uh, 
and matter of fact, a lot of meetings and things, they'll have what they call catchers who are there to catch people that are slain in the spirit. The term comes more from the fact that you fall over. And in some cases, you, you're not able to move. It's not that you die. It's just a term that's used to express a phenomenon you know, that is help, helping. It's easier to say that than to say, well, he fell over dead, you know, or he fell over as if he were dead. That's, so that's kind of what the term means. Um, now, is there a biblical reference? Well, that depends on what you're asking. If you're asking, is there anywhere in the Bible that says somebody was slain in the spirit, then the answer is no. There is nothing that says that. But listen to me, though. That doesn't mean it's not biblical. All right? Just because the term is not there. Let me give you some examples. The term rapture is not in the Bible. And we use it all the time. That doesn't mean it's not or it's not real or that it won't be real. Okay, just because it's not used, the term itself is not used, doesn't mean it's not real. Let me give you another example. The term church. Now, we have translated the word into church, but there's no such term as church in the Bible. The term actually means, in the New Testament, it's ecclesia which means called out or an assembly. In some cases, the term is synagogue, which means the same thing. And in the Old Testament, it was, it was, it, it was, it was a term used to mean an assembly. Okay? So, there, you know, I mean, you understand where I'm going with that. Just because the word is not there doesn't mean it's not right. OK, now, as far as the, uh, another biblical reference, i.e., did something like that happen? Well, I know of one instance that I can give you, and that is Paul, or actually he was Saul in Acts 9. It says in Acts 9, 1, it says, Saul Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples, the Lord went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. This is where he was going to go after the church, okay? After this, um, the stoning of Stephen. And it says that it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground, okay? And heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The term there, he fell to the ground, can be considered being slain in the spirit. Okay? Looking at the fact that being slain in the spirit means falling over. All right? When a supernatural, powerful God brings, brings his spirit or power down upon you, you, in many, in some cases, your body can't take it, and so it falls over. And that's kind of what you know. That's kind of where where it comes from. If you know, if God hit us with all His power at one time, it probably would kill us. But there are times that He comes upon us, and we fall to the ground. We go into a kind of a you know a stupor, and and so, yes, from that standpoint, yes, there is that, that would be one biblical reference to being or what could be considered or what we call today being slain in the spirit. Okay? Does that, hopefully that makes sense. It doesn't cause the, See, a lot of times what we do is we ask questions like that, and I don't know if this person is or not. But we ask questions like that so we can say, see, it's not there, so it's not biblical. And we can't really do that. We have to be able to look at the context and see what's happening. Because a lot of times what we want to do is we got our experience, the Bible's here, 
and we pull the Bible down to our experience. We say, I haven't experienced that, therefore it's not true. When we really should look at what the Bible says and say, okay, my experience hasn't reached this yet. Father, help me to see and move in that direction. You understand what I'm saying? See, we're, we're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to be conformed to his image. Now, I'm not there. Therefore, do I say, well, then it doesn't exist? Or that was for those back before the Bible was totally written? It, it went out when we got the Bible? And there are teachers and philosophers and theologians that tell us that. And we've got to be careful with that. We have to be able to look in the context of what the... It's... We don't know everything. And j just because it wasn't... Um, said the way we talk. I mean, look at, what, look at what John gave us in Revelations. He's talking about things that he's probably never seen or, you know, only maybe we've seen. But you think 2,000 years ago, they wouldn't know what a helicopter was. They would, you know, you know, an insect with the face of a man. You know, that's kind of, a, to me, that's kind of a depiction of, of a helicopter, isn't it? Or a plane. You know, th th those things weren't even in existence then. And so, you know, we can't, um, uh, we can't look at, um, at things from our perspective. We have to go back and look and see, what, you, know, you know, is it possible that when God touches a person, they fall over. I would say, yeah, that's possible. And so then we have something we can start to work from. Well, how does it make you feel is another one. Isn't, you know, do you have enough experience with, the, um, with, with walking in the Spirit to be able to know when the Spirit is bringing um, a caution to you? Sometimes when people tell you something, you start to, you know, you start to either get jittery or tense up or whatever. You know, if it's a, um, if it's, you know, if there's a warning you, and you get another kind of feeling, if you're starting to, uh, if your spirit is, is in agreement with what's being said. But it, that takes practice and walking, walking with God that we should be reaching toward, but we don't have. So, I, you know, in just, a, uh, in just this few short, you know, in this few short minutes, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to teach on it. I, I'm just saying that I believe, yes, it is, it, it is a, it is an experience that God brings on us when he wants to. Now, yes, you can go to meetings and you can see people fall over and some of them are doing it because they think others will see and know that they're spiritual, you know. But we do that with prayer. We do that with our giving. So, you know, that, that doesn't throw it totally out of line. You just have to be able to understand. Uh, and be expectant of God to move. You see, we don't hold, you know, we don't hold the tr total truth on everything. And it depends on people's perspective as to how they see things. If you, you know, uh, if you know people like this, they are they are kind of by the law. If it if it doesn't totally word for word match up, it's not right. And we can't do that. 
we've got to look at what the Bible is saying. Overall, what is it saying? What's the purpose? Is it, you know, is it bringing glory to the person or is it bringing glory to God? That's another way to look at experiences that happen. You know, there are a lot of people that, you know, that will teach you that the gifts of the Spirit are not for today. The they ended when the Bible came. And I'm sorry, but that's not biblical. The Bible doesn't say that. There, was, there is not a dispensation where there were the gifts of the Spirit and then there weren't. As long as we are walking in the Holy Spirit, there are going to be gifts. If there are no gifts, then we can't claim fruit either, as in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit. They had to go out also. So, just, you know, we need to look and, you, and, and you, just need, you just need to pray and you say, Father, will you show me? Will you bring this into my life? Will you allow me to experience it or, or, or no more? Take me to your word and show me. There are some things that you won't Total, you don't, you don't won't see the word rapture, for instance, is not in the Bible, but a taking away is, and that's what the term means. That's what the, that's where the rapture comes from. It's First Thessalonians. So I hope that helped some of you. Again, call or email or uh, go out and contact me through our website, and 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 we can continue this conversation. Or if you have a question, let me know. With that, let's take a break, and we'll be right back. Romans 10, 9, says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Welcome back for the third part of One Man's Faith. Let's look over into Matthew as we continue our study um, on the Sermon on the Mount. That's what we are, that's what it's called. That's what we're looking at in Matthew chapter 5. We started and I think I told you that, or at least I hope I told you, that uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 appear to be, or at least what I'm calling, the constitution of the kingdom. This was uh, Jesus's, at least recorded, first big message. He didn't give it to 5,000 people. He gave it to his disciples. In Matthew 5, it says that when he saw the multitudes, Matthew 5, verse 1, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, okay? And opening his mouth, he began to teach them and he taught them, he said, blessed are and he gave us uh, nine attitudes or emotions or uh, I guess attitudes is, is probably the better words. He gave us nine attitudes that we are to have. We call them the Beatitudes, the be attitudes. This is how we are supposed to be. And then he tells us, he says, you are to be the salt. You are to be salt. You're to bring taste and, and, and uh, preservation to the world. You are the salt of the earth. And I looked at the fact that it doesn't really, salt cannot ever be tasteless because salt is always salt. I mean, there's even, I, I, we mentioned there's even, a massive area of salt that's called Jurassic salt because it's been there for 150, what would geologists call million years, okay? Uh, I don't believe it's been there that long, but, you know, in other words, it's been there a long time and it's still salt, okay? What Jesus is saying in that passage in chapter 5 is that if you don't salt the earth, who will? That's how it can, 
in what what we've translated into lose its flavor or taste or means. It's like if I have five gallons of water and I put six grains of salt in it, it doesn't have any, it doesn't do anything to the water. You don't taste it as being salted water. It has become diluted. And that's what happens. If we don't salt the earth, who will? And that's a heavy question. Because we are to bring flavor. We are to jazz it up the way God or Jesus did and would. And then he said, you are the light of the world. A, 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 a city that is set on the hill, you can't hide it. In the same way, in your house, you don't have all your lamps under barrels so that the light doesn't shine out. That's the purpose of light is to Drive away the darkness. And that's what we are to be. We are to illuminate everything else around us. We're to bring the presence of God in where, wherever we are. And he says now, you know, this is how you're supposed to be, the be attitudes. Here's who you're supposed to be. Here's how you do. Here's what you're supposed to. Here's how you. Here's what you're supposed to be. Here's how you're going to do it. You're going to be salt and you're going to be light. And then, then he goes on and he tells us. Um, and I call this. I'm calling this Article One, Section One, of the Kingdom in Matthew five, verse seventeen. <clears throat> do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever teaches, keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says here that he came to fulfill, not to abolish. Now, what does it mean, I came to fulfill? How do I fulfill? You see, many believe that Jesus said, I came, I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. Therefore, I have fulfilled it. And so we don't have to look at the law anymore. Because he specifically says, don't, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now, the law, when he says law here... He's talking what is called the Torah. Ma uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is the Torah. Okay? The first five books of the Bible that God gave. It's called the law because that's where God's law is shown. Starting with the Ten Commandments and then going on through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy given us the total, I believe they say there's 615 commands total in the law. And then when he says the prophets, he's talking about the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Malachi, you know, Micah, all those, they are the prophets. So when he says I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. He's talking right there, the Old Covenant, or what we call the Old Testament. He says, I didn't come to abolish. I came to fulfill. Now, how did he fulfill? He did all that was required of the one that was coming as the Messiah. He fulfilled all of the prophecies that deal with the Messiah. 
there, I, I believe, if I'm right, there, about, there were about 300 prophecies dealing with the Messiah. And Jesus fulfilled them all through his birth, his life, and his death and resurrection. It is said, uh, let's see, Josh McDowell wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And you can, if you, if you, you can get that book, it's a great book to look at because he presents all the evidence of why Jesus had to be the Messiah because he fulfilled all these prophecies. And he says something like this. He says, for one man to fulfill all those prophecies would be like taking one quarter, coloring it, and throwing it out into the middle of a three-foot deep pile of quarters that cover the area of Texas, stirring them all up, and then picking that one out of it. It's an astronomical amount of being able to do that. He says that's the chances of one man doing that on his own. And Jesus did it. That's how he came to fulfill. Because look what else he says. Uh, he says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. So it hasn't all been done yet. There are still prophecies in the Old Testament that deal with the end time. There are, there are prophecies in the Old Testament that have just recently, i.e. 1948 or right around then, have just been fulfilled. When, when the Israelites went back to Israel and it became Israel again. The prophecy of Ezekiel about the, about the bones and, and speaking to the bones and bringing them back to life deal with with that, of the, of, the, of the Jewish nation coming back to Israel. Because until 1948, it was, it was considered Palestine. Nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted to be there. As a matter of fact, the Arabs in the area at the time said, go ahead, take it. We don't want it. Because they hadn't cultivated it. It was desert. Now that Israel has come in and Israel has made it rebloom again, now we're back to where they want it again. And they're trying to say, we had it first. Well, no, they didn't. Israel had it first. And that is the land God gave them. It is their land. And anything we do to take away from what God gave them brings us into trouble. And we, that's why we need to be careful. And we need to back Israel. God said, I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And so it's a, it's a, it's a responsibility that we as a nation have. And I believe is one of the reasons why we have remained free for as long as we have, is because we have backed Israel. So he came to fulfill the prophecies about the Messiah, and he did that. But he says, um, he says that it will not pass away. Not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Okay, we're not even close to all being accomplished yet. So we cannot say, okay, we don't have to worry about the Old Testament. We do have to worry about it. It's a very important um, It's very important for us. Because it's out of the Old Testament that we really learn who Jesus, who God is. That's how we come to know Him. And 
Mm. You know, if you want to look at this, you know, I mentioned earlier that the word church is really not there. The word is called out once. Every time you see the word church used, and it's only used, I think, three times in the New Testament, it's the word meaning called out or the assembly. Okay? Well, what we today call the church is really the second church. Because the assembly that God had before was Israel. They were his assembly. They are his people. He has not given up on them. And he says, they will come back to me and they will call me Lord and they will do what I have asked them to do. And so it's important to understand that. It's important to understand our roots and understand that what is written here is written even, even in the New Testament. A lot of the New Testament is written from a, an Hebraic perspective. And if we don't understand that, we lose things. We miss things. And we don't understand them. And then we make things up about what's really being said. And so it's something, it's something to look at and, and to consider that, that uh, the word was written by those that were Hebrew. They weren't, it wasn't written by Greeks. Matthew, Mark, Matthew, Mark, and John were Jews. Luke was the, was, the, was the only Gentile in the three. Paul was definitely Jew. And those are the ones that did most of the writing. And so we need to understand a little bit about the Hebraic perspective. Okay, with that, well, let's take a break and we'll come right back. Romans 10, 9, says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, it says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Welcome back for the last part of One Man's Faith. Again, my name is Neil Owen and glad to have you with me. We're looking at Matthew 5. We're looking at what I'm considering the constitution of the kingdom. And we looked at the preamble over the past couple of weeks, uh, Matthew 5, 1 through 20, uh, where he gave us the B attitudes. That's how he's supposed to act. And he said he's supposed to be salt and light. And now we're coming into Article 1, what I'm calling Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution. And he says, I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. And now he goes on and he says in verse um, 21, he says, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, all right, he didn't come to abolish. He came to fulfill. Now we're going to see this down through um, almost the rest of chapter 5. You have heard it said, but I say to you. And here's the first one. You have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Whoa. Being angry? Yeah. See, he's fulfilling it. He's saying, you've heard it said, and the law says, you shall not murder. But I'm telling you, not me, but Jesus, I'm telling you, that if you're angry with somebody, you're guilty before the court. Guilty before the court of what? Murder. You see, it's important to understand that, that, is, that anger is the opposite of love. God is love and we are his children, and we follow after, or should follow after him, because we are made in his image, and therefore, if God is love, and God does love, 
we should love. And we cannot hold in our hearts any anger or bitterness. It can't be there. There's an interesting translation that takes that and says this. But I say to you, he who angers his companion is guilty of judgment. You see, sometimes, I mean, I can, well, let's just, I, I'm going to just come off the top of my head. My, my saying what I'm saying tonight can anger somebody. See, I, but I didn't cause them to be, I'm not trying to cause you to be angry. Okay, if you happen to be, if you are, I'm sorry. It really, I'm not trying to anger you or anything. But did, did, you understand, did, did you hear what this said? He who angers his companion. You see, we're not supposed to be a part of even making people angry. <clears throat> In other words, we shouldn't do it on purpose. It's not right for us to make people angry. Anger leads anybody down the wrong road if you're not careful. Now, yes, there is a passage that says, be angry, but sin not. There, is, there are times where you can be righteously angry, but as long as it doesn't lead you to an act that is wrong, that's the catch. And if you get angry at somebody to where you say, I wish you weren't alive, you haven't done anything, but you've said, you've thought and said something, you see. It's the wrong emotion to have. It's the wrong emotion to have. We can't go that direction. We have to learn to be angry and sin not. If I hear on the news, well, the guy was in Washington who his wife disappeared. He gets the kids for a supervised parental uh, outie and he kills the boys and burns the place up. Now, I, that makes me angry, you see. That was, that was so demonic that, that, you know, that makes me angry. But I'm not doing anything about it. And, you know, I started, you know, thinking, you know, that was, that was a dumb thing to do. See, you see, there was no hope in that. And that's where the world is going. It's going to a place of no hope. Where we should be bringing them to that place of new hope. Living hope, as First Peter says. That's where we're supposed to be bringing them by being salt and light. And so if we get angry and we act it out or we do, you know we do something that is that is not right and th that's the main thing about anger. It kicks it causes you to kick your mind into neutral and do dumb things including murder. You see it starts inside and comes out. When you get angry and you, and you call somebody good for nothing or a fool, you're changing who God made them and you're calling what God made, that he made good, you're calling it bad. Do you, do you see? And so by what we express, we in a sense... And yes, we are made in God's image, are changing what God made. And what He called good, we must call good. And so we've got to watch what happens in our heart. What this is really saying is that character assassination is the same as physical assassination. Character murder is just as bad as physical murder. That's what Jesus is saying. He, he, he tells us later in Matthew 15, he says, But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And it's those things that defile a person. What proceeds out of the mouth 
comes from the heart. And yeah, we, you got to be careful how you talk. We've got to be careful how we talk. I remember um, back in the 70s, uh, there was a terrible uh, airline accident. There was two, two 747s collided. One was taking off and one was landing and there was just a total mess up with you know air traffic control and they collided. Both were full of people. There was a man that gave his testimony uh, on CBN and his testimony was he was on one of those planes. And he said an angel led him off the plane. Now he doesn't know why he lived but what was interesting what he, and what he saw was this. As he was going off the plane all around him people were dying and they were cursing God. And it bothered him. He couldn't figure out why. How can a person who is dying curse God? Why aren't they calling out to him? Because out of the heart is what the mouth speaks. You see, you cannot think that you can wait until the very last moment to accept Jesus. Because if it's not in your heart to do, you won't. It won't be there. Out, the mouth speaks that which comes out of the heart. And so being angry and speaking things, we're speaking things that are, that are of defilement and it, it shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't do that. Jesus goes on. He doesn't stop there. He goes on. He says, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, Leave it, be reconciled, and then come and give your offering. Jeez, God doesn't even want our offering until, we've, until we are right with man. If we're not right with man, man, God doesn't want us to be right with him. We can't be right with him. We have to be right with our, our fellow brothers and sisters. That means you cannot, as a Christian, hold a grudge against anybody whether they deserve it or not because you are putting yourself in the position of God when you do that you have to forgive now I know that's not easy but that's what he says that's what he says we have to do we have to do that he goes on and he says Make friends quickly with your opponent. Uh, while you're with him on the way. So that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. And I say to you, you will not come out until you've paid the last cent. That's dealing with having this resentment against other people. We can't have it. It's, 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 it's not supposed to be there. Jesus said, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Forgive us our debt as we forgive. That's not a quip saying. What Jesus is telling us is God's not going to forgive us if we don't forgive. Now, that's something to consider. We've got to be careful with that. Ephesians 4 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. You see, that's the attitude we're supposed to have. But Neil, you don't know what they did. I don't. That doesn't matter. God says you're to forgive. Yes, it may have been horrendous. He's going to deal with that. You can, you're not doing anything about it now. 
except holding a grudge and causing yourself not to be in the proper relationship with Jesus. Is that what you want? You see, if you don't think what God said is true, then that won't matter, will it? But you've got to come to the understanding that God is serious about His Word. And what did He say? Not one, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away until all is accomplished. And He's saying to us, He says, you want to pray? Here's how you pray. Forgive me my sin as I forgive others. Which says also, if I don't forgive, God, you won't forgive. And we've got to understand that forgiveness is a serious fact with God. We've got to understand that. That's the way he made us. And that's the way we should be. What do you do if you're angry? Find out why. Go to the source of it and ask for forgiveness. Repent. Repent and turn from it. It will block your way to God. And so we've got to get rid of it. Just right now say, Father, I, I ask for forgiveness because I've been angry about this. Lord, I forgive. Help me to walk in that. In Jesus' name. Walk in forgiveness so God will forgive you. He wants to. He loves you. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Romans 10, 9, it says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved.